I'd like to welcome you all to the 2021 Sunsto Sunstone Symposium session number 332, which is Mother Hunger, an exploration of the divine feminine. At Sunstone, we're making it a goal to build a community that allows many ways for people to express their faith. Our tagline is, there is more than one way to Mormon. We invite you to help us build a community where all paths are given space to be better understood Please support us in our mission by making a donation and subscribing at sunstone.org. After the symposium, Sunstone staff will edit, polish, and re-upload all of this year's session videos to the Whova app. It'll take about two weeks for everything to be available, but once it is, every video will be available to watch and re-watch in the Whova app through the end of 2021. And if you'll please type any questions that you have for our participants, um, our speakers today into the Whova app, um, I will help address those later, I'm assuming at the very end. My name is Heather harris Bergevin, and I'm your moderator today. About this presentation itself, in this session, Dana Patterson will read her Eugene England Memorial Essay Contest winning essay, which is Mother Hunger, and Catherine Knight Sontag will share excerpts from her forthcoming book, The Mother Tree. The reading will be followed by a discussion between Patterson and Sontag. Um, I just wanna take a second to introduce you to our speakers before we begin as well. Catherine Knight Sontag is the author of The Tree at the Center, which is from BCC Press in 2019. Her creative works have appeared or are forthcoming in Colorado Review, The Inflectionist Review, the Sublinary Review, Amethyst Review, Psaltery and Liar, Wilderness Interface Zone, Exponent 2, Segala, Dialogue, A Journal of Mormon Thought, um, www.visitutah.com backslash she, Blossom as the Cliff Rose, Mormon Legacies, and The Beckoning Wild, which is Tory House Press 2021, and others. She earned a BA in English and a BS in Environmental Studies before earning her MLA in Landscape Architecture and Environmental Planning. Her thesis focused on the role of the transcendent in landscapes and greatly informs her creative pursuits. She is currently serving on the Poetry Board of Segala. Dana Patterson is the author of If Mother Braids a Waterfall, Signature Books 2020, and Titania in Yellow, Pork Belly Press 2019. She co-edited Dove Song, Heavenly Mother in Mormon Poetry, which is from Peculiar Pages 2018. And Dana, I'm going to turn over to you now. Thank you so much, Heather. Um, I am delighted to be sharing space with uh, Catherine today. Um, I... I'm a huge admirer of Catherine's poetry, and, but also her prose. And I'm really looking forward to her new book that is coming out. And it just seems like um, we're often reading the same things and going down a lot of the same paths. And I find that really fascinating. So I wanted to um, bring some of our work into conversation today. Um, I'm, I'm going to share an essay, as Heather said, um, and Catherine's gonna read an excerpt from her book. And then with the time that we have left over, I'm just excited to talk to Catherine. Um, so I will launch into this essay. This is Mother Hunger. As the camera zooms out to capture the last scene, a paved road winding through Switzerland's rolling green, I feel myself about to break. We're sitting on the bed in pajamas, me and my husband, Saturday night. I'd agreed to watch reluctantly, knowing this director's reputation. The credits begin to roll and I turn to look at him. Why do you, wait? Why do you make me watch such sad movies? And then I start to sob and sob and sob. He puts his arm around me as my shoulders shake. I'm heaving, pressing my eyes with sweatshirt sleeves, partly to hide partly to staunch the tide. When I calm down, he says, after all these years, you still surprise me. What do you mean? I ask him. It was a happy ending. I thought you'd be okay. She was going to see her daughter again. What he says is true. The movie we just finished, Julieta, 
written and directed by Spanish filmmaker Pedro Almodovar, does have a happy ending, or at least its trajectory is a hopeful one. After being separated from her daughter for over a decade, no telephone calls, no visits, no email, the protagonist is invited back into her daughter's life. She's in the car with her boyfriend driving towards the return address scrawled on the back of her daughter and Tia's latest letter. Yes, I agree, but I wanted to see them hug. I needed that closure. My husband nods. Although I'll concede it was a brilliant move on Almodovar's part to end where he did still. I wanted to see them together. I get up to scrub my face, my nightly routine. I feel raw as a fresh scrape, but I can't help rehashing the plot in my mind. And Tia's father, a fisherman, goes out on his boat in a storm after Julieta confronts him about his infidelity. When Antia learns the circumstances of her father's death, she blames her mother, she blames the woman her father was sleeping with, and she blames herself for being away at summer camp where she was happy. As an adult, Antia decides to cut off all contact with her mother. The film follows Julieta's descent into near madness over the loss. Every year for Antia's birthday, Julieta sets out a beautiful cake, hoping her daughter will come home. The cake always ends up in the garbage, untouched. After years of waiting, Julieta is on the verge of moving to Portugal with her boyfriend, starting a new life, but she finds she can't leave Madrid. What if her daughter comes back or sends a letter? The apartment building where they lived is the only link she has with her absent Antia. I pull out the dental floss, careful to curve around each tooth, staring into the mirror. I think of my own mother. She and my father were married for seven years when she made the decision to leave. A long struggle with infertility ended abruptly with three babies in three years. Mounting postpartum depression, bulimia. She would tell me later over and over that she was in such a dark place, so numb. Oh boy, sorry. She would explain again and again that she had to leave in order to survive. I step out of the bathroom. You know, I think the whole mother-daughter separation theme is just a deep wound for me. Even now, all these years later, my mom was absent for almost a decade. She wasn't interested in being part of my life until I was 11, about 11, and I think that still hurts. What Almodovar does in this movie is walk me through my own private version of hell. If either of our daughters chose not to be part of my life, I think it would kill me. My husband is quiet, nods em empathetically. You know, he says, I've heard Almodovar goes around eavesdropping on women's conversations to get inside their heads. I believe it. He has certainly gotten inside mine. I learn later that Almodovar intended for the film to be absolutely tearless. In an interview with Elsa Fernandez Santos of El País, he says, I battled a lot with the actress's tears against the physical need to cry. It is a very expressive battle. It wasn't out of reservedness, but because I didn't want tears, what I wanted was dejection, the thing that stays inside after years and years of pain. Put simply, this had to be a very dry, tearless film. I wonder if my sobs were a natural reaction to the two hours of restraint, the bottled despair aching for release. <laughs> Rung out, I walk down the hall to my daughter's bedroom to tuck them in. I put on false cheer like a soft robe, not wanting to startle them. I'd like to climb onto the bottom bunk and sandwich my big body between their small bodies and just hold them until they fall asleep and then lay awake listening to them breathe, cherishing each inhale and exhale. 
Instead, I give them each a hug, remind them to brush their teeth, admire the dragons and superheroes they've been drawing on the forbidden printer paper. I sniff their shampooed hair, blow one more kiss goodnight, then shuffle back to my bedroom. As I fall asleep that night, I think of the small handful of movies that have had this effect on me. The wrenching, gasping sobs that came uncontrollably. The Duchess with Kira Knightley, just after the scene where she is forced to hand over her illegitimate newborn to her lover's family. Arrival with Amy Adams playing a linguistics professor whose daughter succumbs to a terminal illness. With Almodovar's film, all have this common thread, the separation of the mother from her child. I don't remember the day my mother left. In fact, I don't have any memories of her until I was about seven or eight, a fact that continues to pain her. No matter how hard I try, I can't conjure any memory of her until I was in elementary school, a rare visit to her apartment in Salt Lake City. My younger brother also has no memory of her living with us. He was only one when she left. But my sister, a year older than me, does remember. She remembers my mother's suitcase. She remembers me playing with blocks on the living room floor, oblivious. She remembers the look on my dad's face, the screen door swinging shut. She remembers watching our mother walk away through the screen's wire mesh. Someday, my mom said to teenaged me, I hope you'll be able to understand. The closest I've come was when my own girls were babies 14 months apart. There were days I didn't want to get out of bed, felt I could sleep for a month, days of such searing monotony and saltine cracker sameness I gagged through the hours. I held my mother's hard story in my hands, heavy stone, and began to comprehend its heft. I often wonder about the long-term effects of early separation. My mother had been a stay-at-home mom, the primary caregiver, with my dad working full-time at a bookstore. I imagine my toddler brain chock full of neurons reacting to and absorbing the world around me. According to attachment theory, my ability to take risks, develop a personality, and explore my environment depended on the strength of my attachment to at least one of my parents. I assume that attachment would have been to my mother, but perhaps not. As she was spiraling deeper and deeper into depression, Maybe I would have found the few hours with my dad a more nurturing and responsive slice of my day. When I dig into my memory, the earliest image I can muster, and I'm not entirely sure if it's my own memory or one of the many home videos my dad recorded, or perhaps a dream. What I think is my earliest memory is me on a tricycle pedaling tiny circles around my dad. We're in a basement with hard floors, maybe cement, and he sits on a chair in the middle of my circle. When my mother left and my dad had to work, we spent most of those, those days with my dad's mother, Grandma Kid. I'm sorry, she just passed away last week, so I'm uh, super uh, feeling super emotional about all of this. I'm sorry. We began to call her mom. Sometimes we stayed with a babysitter or went to daycare, but mostly it was grandma mom playing on her backyard swing set, watching Sesame Street, eating raspberries in her garden, petting a new litter of kittens. Gosh, I should have provided myself some tissues. I did not do that. When my dad eventually remarried, it was the summer just after I turned five. My stepmom had a tempestuous relationship with her own mother, and she later confessed to me she absolutely dreaded having daughters. Our relationship was difficult from the beginning, and I remember aching for my dad to get home in the evenings, listening for the sound of his car pulling into the driveway. 
As a teen, I would fantasize. Imagine that I could step back in time and convince my mother not to leave. I daydreamed two possible scenarios. One, I would enter into my toddler body with my teenage brain and future memory. And somehow I'd make my mom's life easier so she'd want to stay. I would suddenly be potty trained and would quickly potty train my sister and change my brother's diapers. I would clean up after my siblings. I would be the mildest toddler and offer cuddle therapy whenever needed. I would make everything better somehow. Or two, I would step through a shimmery time portal as my teenage self, visit my parents' house while my dad was at work, and tell my mom everything that was going to happen if she left. Surely, if she knew how miserable she'd made her kids, if she could conceive what a millstone her regret would be in a mere decade, it would stop her. I fought through these scenarios obsessively, daily. What are the long-term effects of early parental separation? For me, at least, I believe it instilled a kind of separation anxiety, a sort of mother hunger that continues to influence my relationships with my mother and my daughters, that can trigger emotional responses to films and stories, that exists as a deep yearning surfacing in my art and my evolving theology. I was raised Mormon, and for most of my life, I was content with worshiping and praying to God the Father only. <laughs> In Mormon theology, God the Father and God the Mother exist as co-equal creative partners, parents of all the souls on earth. However, members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints have been instructed by their prophets and leaders not to pray to or worship God the Mother. Despite these prohibitions, the past few decades have given rise to a burgeoning number of conversations, academic studies, poetry, and art on the subject of God the Mother, although she is still considered a taboo topic to many. Mormonism is not alone in its peculiar relationship to God the Mother. The biblical scholar Margaret Barker recounts how there was once a lady of Jerusalem worshipped in the temple, but during King Josiah's reign between 641 and 609 BCE, the young monarch instigated a purge of all emblems in the temple's inner sanctum, the Holy of Holies, meant to represent and honor her. Quote, the item named the Asherah, the host of heaven, the horses for the sun, the menorah, the oil, the manna, the high priest staff that bore almond blossoms, the ark, the fire, and the spirit, end quote. <coughs> Excuse me. Although Lady Wisdom had been worshipped for centuries before Josiah's reform, her followers were labeled pagans, her priests heretics. The hammer fist of patriarchy eventually resulted in monotheism, one God only, a God that is male. What remained of the lost lady's cult of worship went underground, leaving archeologists, biblical scholars and historians, the work of piecing together her former glory. In the past few years, I've begun to wonder, what are the long-term spiritual effects of this parental separation? How is society affected over the centuries when only God the Father is worshiped and God the Mother is purged from temples, forgotten, ignored, placed off limits, edited out of sacred texts, effaced, erased? What does separation anxiety and mother hunger look like on a scale that large? Maybe it looks like millennia of misogyny, baby girls exposed on hillsides, witch hunts, foot binding, female circumcision, acid thrown on women's faces when they refuse sexual advances, homophobia, sex trafficking, 
rape culture infecting college campuses across the US. Maybe it sounds like a maniacal president bragging about grabbing women by the pussy. Maybe it sounds like stuffing our ears. Maybe it's the silent spring we've been warned about, billions of birds decimated. Maybe it smells like the lungs of the world burning, like the hot metal bite of iodine-131 fallout after decades of nuclear testing, like the absence of sweet as bees and other pollinators dwindle. Perhaps it tastes like apocalypse. My mission companion and I drove the short distance on icy streets to the Basilica of Notre Dame du Cap. With a stack of cards in our mittened hands, we stationed ourselves near the entrance to the Chemin du Rosaire, a meandering path adjacent to the church that wound past bronze and ceramic statues, depicting the 20 mysteries of the rosary. It was January and not many Quebecois would brave the, re the weather that morning, not even to visit the shrine in its cold cloak of snow. We talked to very few people, mostly devout old women. One in particular, wearing a black wool dress coat, asked if we prayed to Mary. When we told her we didn't, tears streamed down her face as she began preaching to us of Mary's divinity. She fervently invited us to come into the Basilica. And because we were half frozen, half moved, we consented. Inside the Basilica, it was warm and dim. The priest intoned the Ave Maria, the words washing over us. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death, amen. Sometime during that half hour of little light and mumbled oratory music, I felt the first pangs of hunger for the feminine divine. A sinking sense of guilt set in. Why would I want to rob these people of a mother to pray to when I had no mother to pray to? The guilt was laced with envy. How delicious would it be to pray to God the mother, to speak to, thank, petition, beg, bless, question her directly through no intermediary. How delicious, but this was forbidden fruit. I tucked it away in the satchel of my mind. <coughs> Carolyn Pearson, revered in Mormondom as an early seeker and advocate of God the Mother, writes in her poem, A Motherless House. I feel like I skipped something. Hang on a second. Nope. She writes in her poem, A Motherless House, quote, I live in a motherless house, a broken home. How it happened, I cannot learn. When I had words enough to ask, where is my mother? No one seemed to know, and no one thought it strange that no one else knew either. I live in a motherless house. They are good to me here, but I find that no kindly patriarchal care eases the pain, end quote. There is more to that poem, but I'm just, I just cited the first few stanzas. I was electrified when I first read these words, home from my mission, a young mother myself, for I had grown up in a motherless house, doubly bereft. Even though I'm close with my mother now, I only get to see her once or twice a year because we live so far apart. Even when I'm with her, I miss her, as if her absence long ago is a cavernous hollow, an aquifer that can never be filled all the way full, no matter how heavy the monsoon. I try to conjure her presence by strategically placing her favorite color around my home, little reminders, a purple paisley plush throw on the couch, a pot of lavender by the front door, 
As much as I ache for my mother, and possibly because I've ached for her since before memory, I also yearn for the mother. In the past five years, though I've tried to launch projects about other subjects, though I identify as content in my doubt, a happy agnostic, I keep circling round and round her like a divine axis, a magnetic core drawing me to its brilliant and liquid heat. I'm deeply grateful to be a benefactor of so much dedicated effort over the past half century to invite God the Mother back through scholarly excavation, academic explication, conversation, music, and art. And I'm awed to witness the more recent surge of interest in God the Mother, gaining momentum in the new millennium. We stand on the shore of what was once a timid tide tasting the sand, threading round our ankles. Now, a majestic wave, licking us head to toe, pulling us to spirit wombs memory. I'm moved by the many who are working diligently to bring back the mother, including Catherine's work. It seems to me that more and more people around the globe are rolling up their sleeves, readying selves for her redelivery, and not just within Mormonism. Jewish poet and literary scholar Alicia Ostriker writes in her essay, Got the Mother, about Jewish mysticism and the idea that in the beginning, God was separated from his beloved, the Shekhinah. Then, invoking the metaphor of the wolf from Little Red Riding Hood, she describes how God the Father swallowed God the Mother. But like the grandmother in the tale, the mother is still alive and kicking waiting. God the Father is pregnant and in pain. How is the mother going to be released? Ostriker emphasizes that we can all act as midwives to help rebirth and reimagine the Shekhinah, the goddess, back into being after centuries of being swallowed, centuries of purgation and explicit erasure. In her poem, Earth, the Shahina as amnesiac, she writes to the beloved, quote, come on, surely by now you remember who you are. You're my mother, my sisters, my daughters, you're me. We will have to struggle so hard to birth you this time. The brain like a cervix, end quote. My feeling is that an integral part of the struggle for gender equality must engage with humanity's concept of divinity, rebirthing and re-enthroning the feminine aspect of God in our sacred spaces, our rituals of worship, our creative urges and outpourings. Ostriker states, quote, I believe that when women's multiple and layered spiritual experiences and revelations and the poetry born from them contribute as much as men's spiritual experiences and revelations have, everything will perhaps look different on our speck of a planet. God and the soul, good and evil, will have new meanings. Maybe we'll have a better world." End quote. I wonder how the world would exist differently after reconnecting with the feminine divine? How would our interactions with each other and the earth soften when we make space for the goddess in the private corners of our inner rooms? What does a society look like that has had its mother hunger at last sated? Perhaps the trajectory is a hopeful one. Maybe it looks like embracing the feminine masculine in all of us. Maybe it looks like fewer teen suicides across the Intermountain West, like an end to transphobia and homophobia, honoring every person's personhood across the wide and fluid spectrum of gender identities and sexualities. Maybe it sounds like the silence of oil derricks and fracking instruments, 
like the deep silence of blue veined glaciers wrapped in winter, snow lips sealed over the dens of white bears, like ears bent to the earth's perpetual hum, like the music of a billion, billion insects rubbing their legs together, a million, million birds beating their wings as they migrate, navigating by the light of stars. Maybe it smells like clean air, like clear water. Maybe it tastes like the salt of tears released at last after years and years of pain. Maybe it tastes like honey, sweetness gathered under the wondrous eye of the queen. And I'll now turn the time over to Catherine for her excerpt from the mother, mother tree. Thanks, Catherine. Dana, that was just stunning. I, I've, I read over this before, but hearing you read it, it's just, um, it's just astounding. Thank you so much for that. I want to read the whole thing. <laughs> um, I'll, I'll just begin. Um, and Dana, if you wouldn't mind um, putting up that image, that would be fantastic. I'm just going to read a bit from my preface and introduction and the first chapter of my book um, called The Mother Tree. Um, let me hurry and pull this up here. It's called The Mother Tree Discovering the Wisdom and Love of Our Divine Mother. As Latter-day Saints, we believe that our theology begins with heavenly parents. And yet there is a conspicuous silence surrounding what it means for us to have a divine mother individually and collectively. The reality of a heavenly mother in our doctrine is explicit. A recent work, a Mother There, a survey of historical teachings about mother in heaven, documents a substantial amount of LDS references to her reality and nature, comprising over 600 sources of all types referencing a heavenly mother in Mormon and academic discourse since 1844. Statements about the mother from church leaders affirm her as heavenly wife and parent, co-creator with the father, co-framer of the plan of salvation, an involved parent during our mortality and our mother after we leave this earthly realm. These identities alone give me reason to seek her and to understand more fully her role in my salvation and the salvation of the world. While I always believed in the reality of Heavenly Mother, it was when I began to desire to know her that I felt her absence most keenly from the plan of salvation, our temples, and our weekly Sunday meetings. I felt her absence in our worship and our identity formation. What parts of me come from my mother? What is she like? What wisdom and love are uniquely hers to give? And how does she teach and guide me in mortality? Is she merely nodding alongside the father as he gives counsel and commands, or does she have something uniquely hers to impart? More and more of her children are sensing an existential need to know her. I don't know all of the answers, none of us do, but that doesn't mean there are no answers or firm conclusions that we can draw. I believe asking questions and exploring possibilities are indispensable ways to show love and reverence for revealed truth. As children of heavenly parents, we embody traits from each parent because we have come to understand God as he, the majority of our discussion about divine attributes we seek to emulate originate from a male deity. We have had little experience thinking of God as they, let alone thinking of mother God as an autonomous whole being with unique traits, which we as her spirit children have also inherited. We are less experienced at seeking out the mother's attributes. A knowledge of her character, power, and purpose creates wholeness in ourselves and in our theology. Harmonizing their divinely feminine and divinely masculine principles inside our souls leads to unity with them. 
for this work of harmonizing, we can come to the mother tree. The tree of life has always called to me. When I was a child, I would read Lehi's vision in the Book of Mormon and feel drawn in by its ecstatic power. I sensed there was more to the symbol than I could then grasp. Over the years, I found a thread of significant groves and trees running through ancient and modern revelatory experiences, though I was unsure of the significance. I re-encountered the symbol of the tree of life as I prepared my master's thesis on the role of the transcendent in landscapes. I was led to a deeper personal engagement with the sacred symbol as I learned about the tree's archetypal power. One resonance that struck me most was the tree as an image of eternal life that was also inextricably linked to the, divi to the divine feminine. It felt like no coincidence that I became pregnant with my first child as the tree's power to invoke sacred connections between the earth and the heavens was unfolding in my consciousness. I felt the tree return and recenter inside my soul, feeling an absence I had sensed my whole life but could never fully articulate. As my first child grew inside me, the revelation that I was a tree of life distilled upon me. Like the tree of life, I connected heaven and earth as I brought a soul into the world. The symbolism of the tree lived in my very limbs and heart. Inseparable from my new understanding of the tree of life was the revelation of a divine mother in scripture. I found her first in the book of Proverbs named there as wisdom, the tree of life. The eternal presence of the mother rooted in my own religious heritage continued to be unveiled, and I saw her everywhere. In the Garden of Eden, the Garden of Gethsemane, the Sacred Grove, Lehi's Tree of Life, the First Temple in Jerusalem, Abraham's Sacred Oak of Moriah, and the cross from which Jesus' body hung. Her presence beckoned to me to make more profound connections to my own divinity. I discovered in the image of the tree a reflection of my yearnings for unity with the divine, with wisdom, wholeness, and renewal. I experienced once again how our scriptures become alive and bright, responsive and renewed by our engagement with them. As with all things sacred, I have found the divine feminine to be beyond the structure and confines of language. We find her substance, her voice, her abundance in symbolic expressions, layered and transmuting, ever evolving as we develop our discerning of both what is knowable and the godliness beyond mortal comprehension. Our desire for the very real presence of the divine feminine begins to enlighten our understanding of how she manifests on our path toward becoming. From the Bible and the Book of Mormon, we are familiar with the tree as a salvific image. Most familiar to us is the tree of life envisioned by both Lehi and Nephi, symbolizing the love of God and eternal life. Perhaps less familiar is the depiction found in Jacob 5. The allegory of Zenos, quoted by Jacob, reveals one of the most beautiful and grace-filled portrayals of a tree as a maternal figure gathering souls for salvation. In three different verses, the tame tree is called the mother tree. She nourishes and grows her natural and grafted branches with the help of the servant and the Lord of the vineyard, providing life for all who will accept her redemptive powers. The tree image connects maternal care to the saving powers of God, our divine parents. In the mother tree, discovering the wisdom and love of our divine mother, I explore this simple and profound connection between the maternal and the salvific, united in the symbol of the tree. Engaging with an expansive framing of our divine mother's selfhood, wisdom, power, and love, we find in her an essential guide on our personal journeys of becoming. We learn through both the materiality and spirituality of our mother God, her portion of care, for our journeys of transformation and how she as the tree frames the journey itself. Wisdom about her becomes wisdom from her. In knowing her, we are changed into better versions of ourselves with eyes more able to see that she has been with us all along. 
recognizing her place in our faith journeys and consequently in our Latter-day Saint theology reflects the true order of the heavens and restores a vision of wholeness and healing that our hearts desperately seek. In my book, each portion of the tree reveals characteristics of our divine mother. The tree is made up of three distinct parts, roots, trunk, crown, that correspond to three different regions, underworld, earth, heavens. As Latter-day Saints, we are very comfortable with the idea of earth as the place of our mortal existence and with the heavens above symbolizing the life to come, but the idea of an underworld is less familiar. We will simply say that it is an internal region that we experience on earth, a place of beliefs, introspection, ancestral wisdom, and spiritual rebirth. So Dana has graciously put up an image of um, what is also known as the cosmic tree, another one of its um, archetypal names that shows the underworld as the area of the roots, the earth represented by the trunk, and then heaven represented by the crown. And I'm just going to read a short portion of the first chapter, which is entitled Roots, Underworld, Below All Things. So we begin in the region of the roots and move upward through the tree symbol um, throughout the book. The underworld is the region of the roots. We begin our journey descending into this place where life begins, into the underground where roots break free from seed and become the most permanent and stabilizing part of the tree. Roots withstand severe climatic conditions, storing sometimes millennia of experience. Incredibly, we are discovering how root tips function like brains, passing electric currents and storing important information. Elder trees of the forest, the mother trees, are the keepers of wisdom. When mother trees, the majestic hubs at the center of forest communication, protection, and sentience, die, they pass their wisdom to their kin, generation after generation sharing the knowledge of what helps and what harms, who is friend or foe, and how to adapt and survive in an ever-changing landscape. The older trees in the forest discern which neighboring saplings are their own kin. Mother trees connect with their young through the root systems, passing sugars and other nutrients. In the gnarl of beetles and rot, in the communion of roots and fungi, we find powerful life forces, creatures who remind us of the ways in which death is woven into life in endless cycles. The work of the roots speaks to the hidden mysteries that unfold in the dark. They remind us that the dark is alive. The underground plane symbolizes a place of spiritual growth and regeneration, of knowledge creation. Here in this womb space, the unseen and obscured portions of both tree and soul reside. As we know from Alma 32 in the Book of Mormon, we must plant good seeds in good soil to expect our soul tree to thrive and expand into eternal life. Our mother asks us to evaluate the soil and how it has affected our roots. What beliefs, traditions of our fathers from our literal ancestry or our cultural inheritance and experiences may be keeping us from our full potential, what needs to be uprooted. Many of us are afraid of the dark, but even more of us are afraid of being afraid. Mother God teaches us how to let our eyes adjust to the dark and that the discomfort inherent in this common experience of the unknown encourages us to tend to our fears, a truly courageous act. So often the darkness, the unknown, the unfamiliar, the unpleasant, the painful is the very next place where God is preparing to build our trust. While fear exposes the limits of our present capacity, it can also be the perfect tool to reveal our potential capacity. Perhaps most poignantly, the feminine realm of the roots teaches us to face what we don't understand, not with fear, hatred, or resentment, but with acceptance, with the open heart of presence. This divinely feminine wisdom asks for a commitment to reinvention as we stare into the face of what is unresolved inside us. I have felt the presence of the mother in some of the most difficult descents of my life. In the first trimester of my second pregnancy, I miscarried. 
A close friend came to offer comfort and I found myself unable to speak about what had happened. I had no words. After she left, all I wanted was to be flat on my back on the earth. I laid down under the crab apple in my front yard and a deep relief came. I felt my breathing slow and my body relax. I attended only to the presence of the tree, its undulating shape, red fruit and peeling bark. The energy of its living form filled my knowing and somehow I was found by the tree. I felt it aware of my presence and in that mutual acknowledgement, a communion of some significant way. I was held in the trees knowing that everything was, and that was enough. The tree was asking me to be in presence at that moment. The manifestation of light and life before me in the form of that living tree was showing me how to live into the pain to find pain's cure. I also saw my mother in the tree, her power to connect living souls above in the heavens to the mortal realm below and in the tree's composite of life and death. The upper canopy of the old crab apple comprised a gnarl of brittle black branches, a clear sign that the tree was dying, yet its skirting branches were producing perhaps a double load in what seemed to be an effort to make up for what the dead branches could no longer offer. This tree was giving everything to rebirth while surrendering to death. It embodied the endless cycle of life, death, life. I had come to associate with the mother and the same divine creative powers in me. I'll stop there for the sake of time. Thank you. Thank you both. This has been absolutely amazing so far. I think that we need to have a couple of questions, but I know that y'all wanted to do a little discussion first. Dana, do you want to um, do you want to do discussion for a few minutes before questions? Um, we have uh, the question that we have specifically is probably one that you'd you'd love to discuss, which is um, what sacred text feature, the feminine divine, like our, our LDS scripture has limited female characters and seemingly uh, no reference to divine femininity. And um, perhaps you could address that in, in, um, in your discussion. That's a great question. Uh, what, what do you think, Catherine? Um, I, I have turned largely to Margaret Barker as sort of um, someone who has already collected a lot of that work and has looked at the old, the, knows the, the ancient languages, knows the translations, has like the expertise and how to sort of read those works and has compiled them in her own books. So Margaret Barker for me was a fabulous place to start not being a scriptorian or a biblical scholar. Um, her book, The Mother of the Lord, Volume 1, I would highly recommend. It is a scholarly work, so it does require a bit of commitment. But even if you just wanted to sort of flip through the end notes or the, um, the references, you could get a great uh, list going of, of uh, sacred texts that are a good place to start. I think that's a great response. I don't know, um, in the Book of Mormon specifically, you talk about the passages that refer to tree to trees um, and the mother tree as being possible um, places to find the feminine divine in, in scripture. But I would agree with the, yeah. the recommendation of, of Margaret Barker is a, is a great place to start. Daniel C. Peterson also wrote an article a few years ago called Asherah, Nephi and his Asherah. Um, and that sort of piggybacks off of Margaret Barker's work, looking at the tree of life vision through the lens of their, of, of Nephi and Lehi's religious paradigm at the time, acknowledging that they were contemporaries of Asherah and would have known her symbol at symbolism and would have seen her in that symbol um, from Lehi's dream. That's a fabulous article and I would highly recommend that. I'm writing it down. D 
Daniel C. Peterson, you said? Yeah, it's online. Awesome. Yeah. I, I'm glad that you brought up Margaret Barker because that is actually um, one of the things I wanted to ask you about, Catherine. Um, I, I found her book, The Mother of the Lord, to be really fascinating, especially as she excavates uh, and, and shows us where you can see the mother, the remnants of the mother still within biblical texts. But one of the things that I found deeply troubling, and I'm wondering how you have dealt with it, is the implication that the, the child sacrifice um, and the story of Isaac in, in earlier versions of that story, Isaac is actually sacrificed and then is brought back to life and that those sacrifices were part of uh, ritual worship to um, the, the mother goddess. Uh, how have you, <laughs> what have you done with that in your mind, I guess? Um, you know, that that's not an area that I've focused on. It's, mm -hmm. it's definitely present in that book and mm -hmm. caused me to pause. Um, I do know that there were a lot of distortions of, mm -hmm. of Asherah, the cult of Asherah, what it really meant to worship her um, and what she represented. And, um, and there's also, you know, there's also stories in, in the Bible about how sort of she was preserved by prophets that, that there was sort of um there was a outcry or a condemning of other israelite or canaanite gods and goddesses but that there's also instances where Asherah is not included in that sort of purge mm -hmm. so i think it's really hard to know because our scriptures come from a variety of sources edited translated codified by so many different people, mostly men with different agendas. And I think it's just a, a hard thing to know for sure what was sort of like a purely, um, but, I, but I do, what, I, what resonates the most with me is the descriptions of Ashra um, through Margaret Barker, through her, like everything that she's gathered in that book as the mother, a consort with El and Jehovah, that they were together <laughs> um, in the Holy of Holies. And so that there was this association with her and the highest power of priesthood and what it meant to enter into the presence of God meant entering into her presence as well as the fathers and the sons. And that she had a dominion and a reign and a, um, a view and a purpose that was unique to her. And um, that is something that I see, that thread is something I see not just in Margaret Barker, but in other sources and other, um, from other scholars. And so that's what I tend to focus on. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I remember recommending the book to a friend who's not Mormon, and um, but who's very interested in the feminine divine. And she came away from reading that book and saying, um, and, and she has a super, uh, difficult relationship with the Isaac story, the Abraham and Isaac story. And so she just walked away from that, that experience like this, this can't be the answer because of this, um, the, these child sacrifices that took place. But I like your approach. Uh, you take what is nourishing and empowering and maybe chalk the rest up to, distortions, uh, philosophies of men, um, misunderstandings, hopefully. Well, I think part of, I think part of the path to the mother is a path of discernment. And so it really, for me, is moving from the sort of first stage of life, quote unquote, like Richard Rohr would say, where we're, we're reliant on an institution or a body of, of individuals to sort of lay out black and white here's here are the commandments here's the life you're supposed to lead here's how it, it's all supposed to go and you're using your own brain and you're using your own heart and you're relying on the gift of the holy spirit you're relying on your own intuition you're um aware enough you're developing the skills to know when something is triggering for you and why where your wounds are what your wounds are and that's part of the first 
portion of my book talking about the underground is it's like the mother's not just there to say, okay, here's the next thing to check off your list um, so that you can make it into heaven. She's saying, you've got to get in there and pull out those nasty rotting roots mm -hmm. that are there from generations of false traditions and false beliefs as interesting or beautiful or convenient as they might be mm -hmm. and find what is real get rid of the distortions, get rid of the, the illusions and find what is real. And so being able to sort of sit with the fact that we don't have all the answers, we don't know everything, to be in the discomfort of knowing that there's this vast like field of undiscovered truths or realities about your spiritual life, that they're there and to be okay with that and to acknowledge mistakes and to acknowledge maybe when you veer off a different path because of ego, because of wounds, because of whatever, but to come back, to always return and return and return. That's, that's part of her, her, uh, her guidance on our path. That's part of her realm to be there next to us, asking us to continue in a cyclical sort of way to reevaluate the voices we're listening to, is that really your heart or is it mimicking your heart? How did you arrive there? And so I think it's an incredible exercise to begin to just seek, seek truth wherever you can find it. And, and the mother, especially the mother, will help you know how to integrate it. I agree. I really like that idea of the, the path of discernment and um, I, I think one of the things that amazes me about you and your work, Catherine, is that you are doing this discerning work um, and figuring out your your spiritual path within, also within the institution of the church, whereas I have made my home outside. Um, but, you, but you seem to be doing something very similar, which is uh, trusting yourself to... Um, explore and figure out the theology that is working for you and your spirit while still maintaining that that relationship to the institution mm -hmm. <clears throat> which i think is really admirable mm -hmm. um carolyn pearson is one of my heroes and then she's doing that work as well like she's got lots of broad ideas and things but she she makes it work within the institution of the church and i i wonder if you have any thoughts about that well i i honor anyone on a path wherever they are seeking truth seeking wholeness seeking healing um i know for some people leaving is important and necessary um i you know and i i have real wounds from the institution i have real deep wounds and um i also have an abiding love for the restoration that's in my bones. And I feel called to continue that work of restoration mm -hmm. and to be a force for gathering. And I feel called to do that right now within the institution. That could change. I don't really know. And I'm OK with not knowing. Um, but it breaks my heart that there's so many of us just severed from this tree of life, right? Like we need each other so desperately. And like, I think about your mom, like what if she had had that real support from women in her community? Like, I'm not saying, you know, but just what if, like, what if she had had women willing to go down in those depths with her? Mm -hmm hold her in that space, who were disciples of the mother, who really knew what it meant to save a soul in that way. Mm -hmm. I just, we, we have to be that for each other. Like things are just getting worse in ways that are so hard to even grapple with, with climate change, with pandemics, with, it's just exponentially becoming more difficult and we have to say no to this individualized way of approaching success and the world and identity like we belong to each other like you put so beautifully at the end of your essay like 
what would it look like to really belong to each other? What would it really look like to belong with the mother embodies in a way that's so eternally interconnected? I'm gonna get in trouble for a minute for not cutting off our session. We're gonna we're gonna to have to go in just a second. We have one more question though, and I wanted to make sure that if we couldn't necessarily address it fully here to make sure that you knew that it was already in the app and that it is, I, I think, such an important one. Um, it is how could a most like a holistic incorporation of the divine feminine into Mormon theology um, potentially address the intergenerational sins? And I would add, and trauma of um, racism, you know, queer phobia, misogyny, um, environmental exploitation, colonialism, and all of these things. And um, I wanted to, to pose that to y'all very briefly, maybe two minutes before I have to shoo us out. And um, because it is that critical. I would love to hear from you, Dana, if you have. Oh, any. man. <clears throat> well, <clears throat> I, um, that's a big question. Yeah. I, I, I wonder. Th that's a two session question more yeah. than it is, you know. Well, I think, um, I know that the, I know that the institution of the church has, has published essays that, um, seek to address, uh, some of the issues of racism and, um, some of those things. I think what, bringing the mother back into the institution might look like maybe first is just um, a deep and sincere, a sincere apology and an, an acknowledgement of mistakes. Like Catherine was talking about sitting with that discomfort. It's not very comfortable to say that, <clears throat> you know, as an institution, we've made some errors. Um, we've made some missteps. The church is divine divinely led but the people are human and to emphasize that humanity i think that that would be a real first step and i i guess that's not to say that apologizing and acknowledging error is in, in particularly a feminine thing um as opposed to a masculine thing but i just thinking about Catherine's words and thinking about sitting with discomfort and being okay with not having all the answers and acknowledging our, uh, the weeds <laughs> that are, that are among the roots and the soil that, that needs tending. Um, I guess that that's my best answer to that very complex question. What do you think, Catherine? Oh, that's beautiful. Um, I think I would just add there's a, a uniquely feminine aspect of embodiment that I think could really help us. Um, we, we're sort of trained to live in our brains, to be very analytical, to trust that more than anything else. And I think women, when they're being true to themselves and when men or however you identify, you're being true to the feminine aspect of you, you are listening through a more integrated um, way. You're listening not only through your mind, but through your heart and your body. What is your body telling you? You're listening to your spirit. You're listening to how they all interact. And so there is a way in which being in tune with those different aspects of you help you understand that you're a point on a spectrum and everyone is a point on a spectrum. So the trans person sitting next to you or the gay person sitting next to you or the single person or the whoever it is, the, you know, whoever it is that looks different than you that has chosen a different path or is at a different place, like you're all points on a spectrum. You are all, I think of um, Indra's net, like that sort of Buddhist idea of like, we're all mirrors reflecting divinity and we're all connected like a web and we don't reflect everything the same way or how boring, how ridiculous, how dead. And so there's this abundance of life and giving and nurture and purpose for everyone. Everyone has a place at the mother's table. Everyone has a place in her paradigm. 
So I think the potential for healing with the mother, I think it means that the church as an institution itself collapses, honestly. I think we have to, we have to start again. And I think that if we trust her, this, in, this individual path of learning how to trust our own selves will help us know how to trust her to build something more Zion-like in the future. Thank you so much. That was really helpful. Um, you know, you were talking about a, a collapsing and it reminded me of when you're going through a faith transition because you really do. Everything that has been part of your paradigm, everything that has been part of the way that you have formally viewed everything, you know, you have answers, you're fine, you know. Um, it doesn't just shake a little bit. You, you have a full collapse and then a rebuild. And the rebuild might look completely different um, or it might have some of the same aspects as prior, but it, it is, it's a new thing. It's it's. It, I, I think about it the way that you know we talk about being a new a new being in Christ, and that you you've got this new thing. And you're you can't be the same as you were. You can't be because if you are, then you haven't really gone through this this process of thinking and continual reconversion. And so that's just what I was thinking about. You guys, this was a wonderful session. It was uh, absolutely magnificent thoughts. Um, I cried during Dana's essay, so just so you know, you made me cry. Thanks a lot. Um, and I love to be around the thinkers. I, I love to listen and learn from thinkers. That's just, it's one of my favorite things in my entire life to be connected into a community of people who, who think about things and who don't just, um, you know, just say the same things over and over again. I, I like thinking people, it, it makes me happy. So I really appreciate y'all being here today and I appreciate everybody that came. Um, you have a couple of comments, so make sure that you go into the Whova and see the comments of people that really loved what you said, um, not just now, but those that catch up later as, as the recording goes out as well. And thank you so much again. Um, and I'm going to stop the recording and end the session now. Thanks, y'all. Have a great day. Thank you, Heather. Thank you, Thanks. Catherine. Take Thank care. You.